So as you may know, I'm gonna be talking about log management security over the life cycle of logs. I'm gonna do that, I'm just gonna review what the log management life cycle is, and then talk about different implications across that life cycle. It's pretty straightforward, but there are gonna be a lot of slides and maybe a couple text heavy slides. I do have a link at the end that will actually have all the slides, all the resources, and obviously Cisco is streaming and has the slide deck as well. So please don't worry about like the, I think there's only two that are particularly dense and just feeling like, oh no, we got you. So getting right into it, I'm gonna review a couple terms and concepts just so that everybody's on the same page about what they are in the, in the basic sense. So you have a hash, right? When you obscure data, you don't need to reverse a hash. That's the point. It's usually used for things like passwords. You don't need to know what the original form is. If you salt a hash, you're either prepending or pending text so that you can obscure whatever the core text is. This is usually done to combat rainbow tables for commonly known, usually, again, passwords. Encryption is when you securely encrypt, well, encrypt data. You obscure it so that you can reverse it later. You might do this with like a tax ID, right? You need to know what the original number is. There's a database online that I'll reference a couple of times called the Common Weakness Enumeration. This is different than the Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, but you can search both. They're separate online. The weakness database is more broad. It'll say things like, you did not store your logs properly. And a CVE is the Linux kernel has this specific vulnerability that needs to be patched now. So in terms of scope, that is the big difference between these two. A big thing to remember when talking about security, broadly speaking, not just for this talk, but also is to avoid bloating it because it's also, it's a it's a broad term for a bunch of concepts. So if you find that you need to look up networking security, you need to know in what context you're looking it up or else you're going to get more data than is actually useful to you. As a final note, that's very clear. What do I not mean by security? Anyone hear this phrase before? Secure to be it by obscurity? You don't want to do this, right? There will always be consequences, and they will not be fun. And it usually creeps up on people. It'll be things like, well, if they don't know where it is, it'll be fine. No one knows my company. I'm small. I, you know, there are bigger fish in the sea, whatever. And then you just mess up your own stuff by trying to implement this. You know, and that's fine until it's not. Similarly, key management, right? Has anyone ever worked at a startup where they're like, we only need one key? It's fine. I see a couple of nods. No one's brave enough to raise a hand. It's cool. It's cool. But you don't want to share keys, right? <laughs> probably, probably goes without saying, but just in case it doesn't. <laughs> or else. That's the main gist of that section. So just be aware that people make concessions in security all the time, but please try not to. And relevantly, how do these concessions or not apply to logs? Over the course of a log management cycle, you have something, an app or a physical device that is generating a log. It's usually stored in memory, and then it's stored on a physical or cloud volume of some kind. It is then sent to either an, an on-prem or a SaaS solution that centralizes the logging so that you don't have to go into all these different devices to find what they're chattering about. You then consume them in a way that is convenient to you or your teams. And at some point, you do have to destroy them, even though I appreciate that last bit. It's probably a little bit nerve wracking, right? Top heavy is create. The biggest thing in creation is not to write sensitive data to your logs, ever. Do not write sensitive data to your logs. But what does that mean, right? Sensitive data can mean a lot of things. Text heavy slide number one. Sometimes these things sneak in because you think you want them or you think you need them, and so you log them, right? You don't want to have a message, an error message that is so vague as, for example, 500 internal server. Good. <laughs> it tells you absolutely nothing. You don't know where to go. But at the same time, if you make it too granular, for example, matching results. If someone logs in and fails to authenticate, right? So this is an authentication concern. If you say, oh, you were close, but not quite there, you've just told them they were close. <laughs> and it might not happen with text passwords much, but it totally happens with bio recognition, right? 
thumbprints, faces, retinal scans, et cetera. It's like, oh, you're close. Just keep wiggling your finger around. It's like, I mean, you could tell me that <laughs> or you could not. Um, similarly, sometimes people fall into a trap where really identifying information is, again, really unique by definition. And so you're like, oh, I can make my databases or whatever really simple. But now I've made them really sensitive and I definitely can't have a data breach. And the biggest thing about not logging sensitive data is if you don't write it, they can't steal it because it's not there to be taken. Only log what you need. And this is a highly customized statement. When you know your data, you can get a better feel for how much information you need to stuff in an event. But it, you need to put enough in so that you can tri triage and troubleshoot accurately when something goes wrong and no more no more than what is bare minimally necessary. But sometimes people still say, I really need that data. And they say this a lot. It's number 532. So it happens. And this is where we talk about the hashing, the salting of the hash, encryption, and other things, redactions, where you will partially log something. And the idea is to try and get around it. You might also tokenize, for example. So you might have a really highly sensitive, restricted database and it has the sensitive data, maybe a token of some kind, and then you point to that other thing instead of directly logging whatever that sensitive information is. What sensitive mean can also vary a bit by regulatory requirements, HIPAA not being GDPR, but they're both very restrictive, right? And if you need to adhere to both, then you need to adhere to both. Once they've been created, you're gonna store them somewhere on the volume or something that is attached to the actual unit or cloud compute or et cetera in question. This is where you're gonna restrict access to that volume, right? So you're trying to prevent people from being able to access your logs before they're shipped out anywhere. This can mean don't let anyone log into, in AWS terms, the EC2 instance with its volume. Don't allow people to retroactively edit the file. Maybe encrypt the log file depending on what it's logging. Rotate them out so that if you do have a compromised server instance, they can only go back so far and mess you up so far. Once it's stored, you're gonna ship it off somewhere. You might do a centralized like logs solution or you might do something on-prem via a license agreement or however you choose to, to go with that. I know Elasticsearch is pretty common for this, especially if you're self-hosting. And in that case, you need to make sure that your SaaS solution or whatever you're implementing is in request in alignment with whatever regulations previously mentioned. So if you are adhering to things like GDPR and et cetera, you need to make sure that your solution is as well, right? Because even though it's a centralized logging server, be it on-prem or third party, it's still getting stored somewhere. It's just a different disk. So make sure that that's secure. Make sure that the shipping is secure and relevant to y'all. Make sure that the network is secure so that they can't intrude on the communications traffic. Once it's in that centralized server, you're going to do what's called consume and convert. And usually this is things like you might send a bunch of plain text, but you don't want to parse plain text. You want something like JSON or something that you can query, <laughs> right? You don't want it just sitting there and like, oh, that's good. I have five terabytes of logs per month and now I have an outage. You know, you want to make sure that it's usable, but while you're doing that, you're also exposing it unless you lock that down. And this, again, for the SaaS solution, you're mainly focusing on access control here because whatever you're using is what's going to be doing that conversion. You're not going to be manually doing that. So if you prevent, say, the intern from accessing your production data, that will help you because everyone makes mistakes and you want to limit the scope of that. You also want to limit certain types of queries Back in its early days, Elastic had a handy blog post where they basically detailed what an unintentional map explosion looks like, which is basically a query that just couldn't finish. And it would stall out the instance and crash it, which is not ideal. But if you know about these limitations on your, of your solution, be it Elasticsearch or otherwise, then you can start to mitigate them. I actually recommend taking a look at the blog post, not because it's still relevant, because they definitely patched that before they broadcast it on their blog, but it does get you starting to think about, okay, well, what does a malicious or accidentally malformed query look like that I should be stopping? And now for destruction. Who feels anxious at the thought of destroying data? <laughs> really, none of you? I don't believe you, someone lifted an eyebrow. All right, litmus test. Just raise your hands. 
so I can see you do it. Five. All right. Of you five, who's afraid of deleting data? Half? Same. All right. Half? Okay. Half. It comes up often. People don't like to delete data. It comes up more often than, but I need that secure information by a lot, right? It's 117. And the idea is that people know that they don't, they need to retain it for a certain period of time. They don't really want to delete it though, because they might need it later. But you do need to delete it because if you have an intrusion, you've now extended into your history how far back someone can go. Again, usually requirements like GDPR that I keep mentioning, they'll have requirements that say, I think it's seven years or something like that, where you have to purge after a certain point or you have to purge under certain conditions. And you need to know what that means because a simple delete just removes the placeholder. So it can be written over eventually, but the data is still there. It's just not being referenced anywhere in your systems right now. If it needs to have it written over so that it's actually destroyed, or if you do what's called a cryptographic erase, which is where you delete the key, but you leave the original file, these are all different types of deletions that are usually outlined in regulations where they're like, this is what delete means. And if you work at something like finance or health, you might actually have to physically shred drives, which sounds cool, actually. To kind of recap some of the top level things in there, because I know it, it got a bit towards the end. The biggest thing you need to know is your data, right? Because sensitive can be rel very relative. I mean, obviously a tax document's a tax document, but if you know that someone can map out your network by IP addresses, don't log them. <laughs> log something else, that the instance name, anything else, right? You know what trade-off you're making, and it's the same thing with knowing your infrastructure. If you know what switches are more vulnerable than others, if you know what's publicly facing versus internal, you can adjust whatever security requirements you have accordingly. This allows you to factor in the risks, again, because you know where your edges are and you can map around them. Everything is very customized. So there's tons of advice, not just here, but on the internet and the collective of human knowledge. Don't apply anything that doesn't apply to you. Like I make jokes about tax documents, but if you don't have tax documents, you're like, cool, right? It doesn't matter to you. Trust but verify means that you really hope that that third party service is deleting that data, but you should verify that they do. Make sure you make heavy, heavy use of metrics as well. So one of the earliest attentions that something is going wrong is when maybe something's running more than it ought to be. And you're like, oh, that's a crypto miner. That's neat. And now I'm at 82% CPU. And that can be a very early detection for you if you didn't catch the security breach, what, be it off or whatever else happened. Make sure that you protect your audit trail, because if you do not protect your audit trail, what will happen is you might have a security incident and everyone's EC2 user. Yay. And you're not going to be able to figure out where that intruder came from. You want to make sure that your alerts are well designed. Has anyone on this side of the pond heard about the target fiasco back in 2014 or 15 at all? OK, quick recap. Target had a massive data breach a few years ago. When they publicly released their statement, they said because their infrastructure is so complicated, their engineers were so overwhelmed with alerts that they couldn't see the alert of the security breach because they weren't adequately signal to noise figuring that out correctly. And so what ended up happening is they just had all alerts all the time and it was too much chatter for people to distinguish what was actually important. Don't do that. Make sure that you have the right amount of noise for what you need to know. If it's important, if it's a breach, you need it to be loud, ping your phone, whatever. And if it's something you can do the next business day, have it pop you an email or something, right? And that'll make sure that you get something like a security breach notification. No one expects anyone to know everything, right? This is, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And even this has a lot of resources that'll be available online. So make sure that you're asking security experts or within your company or broadly on forums or whatever. Don't expect yourself to know everything about the field, right? And lastly, prevention, going back to the don't log sensitive data, it's the difference between this is inconvenient and this is a disaster, right? You have in the States, we had the Equifax breach where everyone's social security numbers were hemorrhaged, and that is a disaster. If they weren't logged, it would have just been annoying, right? And on that note, top level overview, make sure that you're scoping your security questions appropriately depending on what concept you're trying to look into.
please don't, don't store the sensitive data. I know I keep saying it because it's important. <laughs> Know your data and your infrastructure so that you know what concessions you're making. Because if you don't know, hey, I needed to do this quickly, so I didn't do this other thing. If you don't log that somewhere, if you don't write that down, you're going to forget that you've done it. And it's going to come up. And on that note, does anyone have any questions? And does anyone want to fill out the survey while you ask me questions? <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had to insert the key uh, at some point, uh, but uh, if, if someone has access to the server, the key is also available to them, so there is not, no, not a difference if, if the logs are encrypted or not. Okay, so the question is, I'm going to repeat that back at you, how to encrypt the logs because other people might need access to that log? No, because other people might, might have the might key. The access to the key. Okay. The key has to be stored in the server if I want it to reboot uh, without uh, intervention. So the key, depending on your setup, I'm going to caveat this heavily, depending on your setup, the key does not need to be stored on the server. And to reiterate that, the question is, how can you encrypt when you, not, when you cannot necessarily secure the key that is decrypting? You definitely need to secure the key. So that might be a key management system where you're not storing the key on that server. You might store it separately, separate instance, separate network, separate everything. Just get it as far apart as possible so that what you're using to decrypt the log is going to be very separated from what anyone actually has access to. And it's important to think about who actually needs that key, right? Because you, as an engineer, are not necessarily looking at the raw log file. You don't need that key, actually. The only thing that needs that key is the shipper that's going to put it in the central log management system. And so realistically, you can lock that key down pretty hard and have the shipper have the only thing that has authorized access to that key. You ship it, and then you're worried about access controls on your log management server. Yeah, Good question, definitely. Any other questions? Say again? Yes. These are the re references slides. So Cisco streaming and has all the presentation materials, but the supplementary reading is on the second link. So I'll just leave that hanging up there. And while people are taking pictures of this slide, does anyone else have any other questions? There might be a notebook in it for you. I may have some custom made swag hidden in my backpack behind the podium behind there, if anyone has another question. I'm tempting you because I feel like I'm looking at your face and you look like you might. <laughs> hmm? I have a question. Okay. <laughs> Yes. How to make that the logs will be processed properly and will be not um, changed for, for the authorized people? How to, how to, for example, keep the integrity of logs? Mm -hmm. And how to, how to keep it? Do you have any experience? Because uh, this, is, uh, this topic is really important and uh, in all ISO uh, requirements are yeah. in, in the logs. But in the real and by real world, mm -hmm. the administrator has the rights to, to write the logs. Can also somehow inter, um, change the integrity of the logs. Right. How to how to is there? Do you have any okay. So there, were, if, um, it sounded like there were a few questions in there, so I'm going to break them out. So there was a concern about how do you actually implement security over the log management cycle because it's huge. And then there was also a concern about real world activities where someone could have access to, like the IT admin was when you called out, have access to something and they could actually change something intentionally or otherwise. So that, that there are two separate answers there. In terms of the life cycle, you're going to have to workflow it. And the idea is once you know your data and your infra and your network and all the good stuff, 
you're going to map it out and you're going to be like, what's the concern here? What do I run? Am I running an e-commerce site? Do I care about credit card? Do I not run e-com and I just host Instagram pictures? Right. And once you know how sensitive that is for you and what regulations, whatever, you're going to start there. And then out, you're going to do the same process, though, through every step of the cycle. So you're going to be like, OK, this is how I'm storing it. This is how I personally am storing these log files. This is how I am personally am shipping them. This is me searching for the vulnerabilities that this shipper has. Right. And you're going to keep going through till you get to the end where you're like, this is how we're going to destroy logs once you hit the other end of the cycle. So it's a very heavily customized product process. It's an iterative process. You're going to change it as your needs change, as your code changes, as what your host is hosting is changing. It's not something that you're going to set once and leave it. Okay. Um, as for the other thing with access, it kind of piggybacks off the question that he asked with regards to what if you can't secure your key or what if your IT admin has access to something they shouldn't. And realistically, you have to scope. And uh, this happened to me at a startup I was at a few jobs ago where it was a startup. So everyone had access to everything. That sh shared key is only a half joke, right? Because they didn't want to do a key management system for what was at the time a very small startup with only a few engineers. But then when they started to scale, it became problematic because everyone had the same credentials. And so as their infra person, the first thing I did was I started scoping things. I'm like, we're no longer jacks of trades. Your front end, your mobile, and I codified them, and I, we were using AWS, I codified them in, in profiles and security profiles. I am, if you're familiar with the AWS term, I codify what they were, they got separate keys, and going back to who needs access to what. Does the IT admin really need to edit the raw log files? No, no access. The only thing that has access to edit are the things that are manipulating the logs, and those are the shippers, or anything else as a part of that process log rotate and things like that. You don't want to have human processes able to contraindicate them. Sure. So going back to, so the, the caveat there was, what about when you only have a couple of people? And the answer to that is the don't apply what doesn't apply. Right? We're not all Facebook or Amazon or whatever. Right? We're not going to handle things at their scale. When you have 100 engineers, you're going to manage the team very differently than when you have two IT admins. And ideally, you still wouldn't share a key, but if you have one person that suddenly became two, you're not expected to overhaul your entire IT infrastructure to support that new person the day they start. Right? But you are going to start to be aware of that sometime between two and three and five and ten that you're going to slowly start iterating, changing your infrastructure and how you're doing security. Yeah. It's a good questions. <laughs> it is security is it's not a trivial thing. Yeah. So the raw separation is the is the is the is the option, yes. Right. But in say this is only one way. So the addendum that is being added uh, is basically again if you only have one or two people, separation of roles is great, but you only have one or two people, what are you what are you doing? And again, you're not necessarily going to splinter that finely at such a small scale. When you're looking at these small scale startups, there's a reason why they function the way that they do. You're sitting likely in the same room or a video chat away. You effectively have to pair on almost everything because there are two of you and you need to not step on each other. There's a lot of communication going on in an ideal world. You do not have to design or architect around a large infrastructure because that's not what you're doing right now. And this goes back to the don't apply what doesn't apply, right? So if you start to scale out where you're like, oh, I need to add in this concept, I need to add in this concept, then add them in. But if you're small and it doesn't apply to you yet, and you're just like, you know what, the only thing I care about right now is access controls. Awesome. Do it up. Yeah. Any other questions? One, two. All right, so before you guys head out, as a reminder, 
please com complete the survey. They have it on a whole separate slide that we give you. If you have any questions that you think of after you walk away rubber duck style, please feel free to join the discussion on the WebEx app. I am pingable on WebEx, so just ask me there, no problems. There are lots of different things going on, not just in DevNet, but the variety of the conference. If you're following a track, if you're doing any of the certification programs, make sure you're walking around and keeping track of those. There are also a couple of notes they wanted to make sure you know. There's going to be, um, there's a Meet DevNet 2864 for the DevNet certifications that starts every morning at nine. Head over there if you think it'd be cool. Bring your software skills and have a blast, right? Also, if you want to look at the network automation and more, this is where you go. You might want to just snag that QR code. I'll leave it up for a sec. And on that note, it was lovely to speak with y'all. Thanks for coming over, and I hope you have a happy rest of the conference. See you tomorrow.